in 1996, when the protease inhibitors became available, it really became important that people took their medication and did not miss. Uh, and so we made a big issue out of this, had big fights. And more recently, they've appointed a public health uh, funded uh, infectious disease nurse to each prison hospital. And that has made life so much easier. Now we have our patients are monitored. They're, if they're not taking their medication, somebody will notice. They don't run out of medication. So life has really improved. And the standard of care for HIV patients in the prison is pretty well as good as, if not better than it is on the street because we don't have any trouble getting the medication. Each institution has a dedicated infectious disease nurse, which I think without them, we wouldn't have the successes that we have with their HIV clients. Because those HIV clients, they have that one person that they know they can go to at any given time. And those relationships are built, you know, over years because most of them are inside for many, many years. So I think having a close relationship and the trust, like I said yesterday, is key. You're not going to go and discuss your status with somebody if you don't trust that person. So continuing to build those relationships with those infectious disease nurses, like no words can describe how important that is. And even talking to the HIV guys, I mean, I know all of them because I've been around long enough to know. I mean, they do really, really respect the infectious disease nurse and how much they advocate for them in getting the things that they need. So without them, we wouldn't have the successes that we have today. The nurses that do uh, correctional health care are incredibly motivated, dedicated, extraordinarily, um, you know, uh, oriented and passionate about what they do in terms of um, caring for this, you know, the, 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 the people that are uh, incarcerated federally. Um, so irrespective of those policies and programs that might limit, you know, sort of what we can do, I mean, I think that the, um, the work that's done, especially at that level of of the nurses in the institutions is uh, is extraordinary in the ontario region we have 39 hiv offenders and they are followed very closely by our infectious disease nurses inside the institutions and by our HIV uh, consultant, Dr. Ford, and of course, our institutional physicians. Some of them are very forthcoming in sharing their status to other offenders, while others are very, you know, they keep it tight to their chest. Um, I did have a ha-ha moment a few years back when I was delivering one of my programs uh, to the offenders. In my program, I had an HIV offender, and he had been in in corrections for quite some time. Um, and of course, the outcome through New Haven, which is the, it was the assessment unit at that time. Um, and somebody found out that he was HIV positive, that he was what the range that he was living on. And a few of the guys that had found out, they were younger, and basically they made his life miserable and pretty much pushed him off of the range. So they got him removed from the range. Those same guys were in that class that I was uh, doing at the time. And after the educational piece on HIV, they got up and said how sorry they were for discriminating against the HIV offender that was in the class. So that was, you know, it really showed me, okay, education goes a long way. I guess one of the important things that I think that, that we offer is a historical impact. We know the real history of Canada. You know, and, and those things that place us at risk for HIV. You know, we understand residential school, the 60s scoop, all those things that happened to the genocide that happened in this country. So we can address that specifically to the Aboriginal inmates, you know, and provide them with cultural, traditional um, ceremonies, you know, and in boosting their identity as either a First Nations, Métis, or Inuit person in this country to a place of pride rather than shame. And so, so it's very important to build that up so that they know that they have something to offer. And we, we, um, we engage their blood memory, you know, or their inherent memory. And, and so it's very important, you know, for us to reach them so, because we do have a high rate of HIV in our community. It is an epidemic. Organizations now are having to meet that criteria or that mandate where they have to have an Aboriginal component. And that's where we come in as OHAs to fill that gap and then work with the men and the women inside and out. I wish I could say the same for me. <laughs> 
truth is they don't let me in. I mean, I've been around corrections since about 1978. I started as the first Native women woman liaison person in Canada way back then when. There was no harm. There wasn't even a thinking of harm reduction back then. There wasn't even HIV back then, right? You know, we were fighting to bring in our spiritual teachings with inside of, of the prison systems inside of Canada. And so it wasn't until 1992 when they passed an amendment to the correct the Conditional Correctional Release Act that gave status to our elders the same as any any other spiritual leader coming in. So I've been a very vocal. <laughs> so and, and I still remain to be vocal. So at some point they decided that my message, like so because my me- message has changed, my message is harm reduction. It's about meeting people where they're at. It's about accepting where they came from, you know, and uh, they're not they're not really accepting of a different kind of message. If you're trying to actually do work where you understand like social net like a social network kind right. of a work in, in uh, within a prison, it's actually more difficult than than uh, you would uh, initially think because there is a there is movement. Um, and they have fairly complex uh, infrastructure, um, but it's um, it's challenging. Um, just like it's challenging to keep track of how people in a hospital move around. That sort of work in terms of trying to understand uh, behaviors and movements within correctional facilities. And, I, and when I'm speaking about this, I'm speaking mostly about federal correctional facilities. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there hasn't been much of a conversation about that in the last um, so many years. So when I'm speaking about the understanding of uh, behaviors and movements within prisons, that's based on an experience I had over a decade ago working with Correctional Services Canada. If you work in a hospital, you know, you go in, you know what your clientele is for the day, you know that you have to do five IVs or you have to do certain treatments. We in corrections, even though our day, we know what the day is supposed to bring, you know, we have a doctor clinic, we have a dentist in, we have a treatment room where we do various things such as vaccinations, dressing, ECGs, cardiac profiles, diabetic profiles. So all that's planned out for the day. But one thing can throw that off. So when you think about lockdowns, for instance, if something happened the night before, there was an incident in the yard and they found a shank, which is a homemade weapon, then that institution, if the warden or security deems fit, that institution can be locked down. So when it's locked down, that means nobody moves. That means that any clinics that you had booked for the next day is not going to occur. So the only thing that will happen then is if, say, uh, our insulin guys would be seen because they have to have their insulin or anything emergency would be seen. But anything else that you had scheduled for that day is not going to happen. I would like everybody to address the elephant in the room, which is not HIV, it's hepatitis C. Um you know, we've we spent a lot of time, everybody spent a lot of time worrying about HIV, which never turned out to be the problem in the prisons that everybody predicted it would be. Um, and the reason for that is that it's relatively hard to get HIV. You have to work at it. So if you look at what happens to drug addicts and bad street scenes, the first thing that happens is they get infected with hep C within a year or 18 months. It takes four or five years to get HIV. And so it's harder to get. Uh, what I would like, and we know that Hep C is is being transmitted in the prisons. We did a study that demonstrated that quite clearly. Uh, I would like to see harm reduction beefed up in the prisons, and I'm, by harm reduction, I'm not talking bleach that doesn't work. I'm talking needle exchange.